How does a composer go about writing a song for a zone about a battery that can fly? Oh, actually, the dictionary also defines battery as the guns of a warship and an artillery unit in the armies. Oh, okay, flying battery. That makes a lot more sense now. But you already knew that. The lead melody opens with an eighth rest on the very first beat, and we've seen this in other Sonic 3 songs before. It's followed by a long, sustained note that lasts a measure and a half. Such long lead melody notes are a rare occurrence in Sonic 3's soundtrack. In fact, the only other song that features such long notes is Launch Bass. But this long note meets a sharp contrast when the measure ends with seven rapid sixteenth notes. It's not the first time we've seen something like this either, as Azure Lake also features measures that end with seven sixteenth notes slated in the latest possible slot. This compositional piece of DNA also appears in Angel Island's bass, and in all three instances, the melody contours are strikingly similar. Three notes moving down, one moving up, and the remaining three down. And in Flying Battery, this rapid-fire 16th note fest is capped off with the return of the tritone, the devil's interval we saw in Marble Garden. One of the song's fun touches is its use of the minor chord with a chromatically ascending fifth, a device predominantly associated with the James Bond theme. You start with a minor triad, and then you have the fifth of the chord walk up and down chromatically. Its use in Flying Battery lends the song a slick tone of nimble infiltration. As for the real thing, there have been countless iterations of this chord progression throughout the 007 franchise, the most definitive being Goldeneye for the Nintendo 64. In fact, the file select theme explicitly articulates every note of each chord on the vibraphone. The bass line in Flying Battery is quite the militant machine. In fact, it's some kind of inverted mirror image of the James Bond motion because it starts on the tonic to move down, then back up with the same chromatic increments as the 007 sequence. This makes for a notable symmetry that has the net effect of a sort of back and forth pendulum. Each measure features abrupt octave hops, with the distinction that the first pair have two high notes, while the second pair only has one each. These octave hops each peck a punch and have the effect of warning shots fired by Robotnik's militant crew. And if the overall texture of this bass line sounds familiar, it's because Flying Battery is Death Egg's spiritual cousin. This should come as no surprise, because they are both Robotnik's aerial warships. Comparing the two bass lines next to each other, we see that both rattle away on the tonic home bass note of one. They also both make abrupt leaps up to the 7-8 and the 4-5. Here they are in action. The flying battery death egg connection doesn't end there. Someone by the alias Cyber Shell theorized that after being defeated by Sonic at the Death Egg, Robotnik retreats to the Flying Battery as his backup stronghold, as evidenced by the fact that Knuckles faces Robotnik as the Flying Battery boss, even though all the rest of Knuckles' boss battles are against Egg Robo. But as he acknowledged, although it's fun to believe in this as intended canon, there's actually a practical reason that reveals it to be a development mistake. See, all the bosses in Sonic 3 are designed to have Robotnik's sprite facing the side, except the Flying Battery boss, which faces directly forward. This would have required the separate creation of a forward-facing Egg Robo sprite, but they didn't bother because Knuckles was never meant to go to Flying Battery Zone. 
As you know, Sky Sanctuary and Death Egg aren't included in Knuckles' playthrough for reasons of plot continuity, and the same thing was supposed to happen with Flying Battery. This is evidenced in part by the fact that Flying Battery has no Knuckles exclusive areas. And, since Flying Battery was originally intended to be ordered between Carnival Night and Ice Cap, the expected absence of the Flying Battery explains why Knuckles warps between those two zones for the level transition, which was all well and good until later in development, when they decided to split the game into two separate releases. This posed a problem for the standalone release of Sonic and Knuckles, since this would have left Knuckles with only three true zones, which would have made for an unsatisfyingly short game. So with Flying Battery brought back in, perhaps they didn't immediately realize they would need a forward-facing Egg Robo sprite, and by the time they did, the sprite library was already locked in. So, Robotnik it is. But similar to the Act 2 music glitch in Angel Island, this is yet another oversight that's actually in service of the game's narrative immersion. And Flying Battery's inclusion in Knuckles' run provides an additional opportunity for players to hear some of the slick techniques the composer used in the lead melodies of Section B. Flying Battery is written in a minor key, and within this framework, it's standard to use the minor seventh. Listen to how it resolves to the one. A common technique, though, is to insert the major seventh instead, which makes for a more powerful, directly adjacent resolution to the one. We see Flying Battery make use of the major seventh in section B, which packs an exciting sense of force and momentum. We touched upon this in the Desert Palace video. It's a common technique for a minor keyed song to use a major seventh, and tracking its occurrences throughout Sonic and Knuckles zones reveals it to be narratively relevant. In the Lava Reef video, Cutman pointed out that Sonic and Knuckles always felt darker than most other Sonic games. We see this reflected in the fact that, of Sonic and Knuckles zones, 5 out of 7 are written in a minor key, and even the two songs that are in a major key utilize minor elements liberally. Of the 5 minor keyed songs, we just saw how Flying Battery uses the major 7th, which is followed up by Sandopolis' use of it as well. But as we progress through the plot and delve deeper into Robotnik's sinister schemes, we find use of the more subdued minor seventh, contributing toward a growing sense of despair where hope becomes harder to come by. Lava Reef Zone Act 2 illustrates a prime example. We see the Major Seventh return for the forceful finale at Doomsday, arriving just in time for the final clash between the superpowered life forms of good and evil. So, in total, the use of the Major or Minor Seventh provides a subtle litmus test for the thematic contents of each chapter. In Sonic Mania, T Lope spiced up Act 1 with a sort of bass mini solo that occurs during the downtime between main melody phrases, a sequence that temporarily does away with the established rhythmic structure of the bass line in favor of some spastic fun. At certain moments of Act 2, in between each beat he added pairs of 16th notes that give the song a feel of industrial ska. And the crowning jewel, if you can believe it, is that T. Lopes snuck in the endless mind rhythmic motif in here. T. Lopes, you sly devil. Congratulations, you have won the day. Now, a lot of fuss has been made about Carnival Knight's Barrel of Doom as an unfair cheap shot puzzle, but what's less discussed are these parachute bombs on the roof of Flying Battery. How many kids must have first arrived here to think, oh, this is a dead end, only to fruitlessly backtrack for who knows how long? And even after you figure it out, all subsequent playthroughs require you to wait there like a jerk until enough parachute bombs open the opening. Hirokasu Yasuhara greenlit a waiting mechanic in a Sonic game? This is Sonic, not Earthbound. And during the excruciating wait, time seems to slow down, and the music along with it.